Uh, Hebrews chapter uh, four, or 12, verse 28 says this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So we're thankful to be here this morning. I uh, hope you enjoy this time of worship as our band leads us. Let's uh, join our voices together. Let's sing together. Let's sing together.
times two.
six-year-old son. Um, every Monday and Tuesday, I take him to Graham and Granby's house while I'm at work. And we get in the truck, and the first thing Zach says is, can we listen to We Believe? And I've explained this more than once to him that the DJ is the one who puts the music on, and we have to be patient and wait for him to put it on. But the song We Believe is from the Newsboys. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have not. But I'm going to read the lyrics now, and uh, no, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> now, I just want you to listen to these words and uh, just think about it. Uh, in this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation we believe. In this broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation we believe. We believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit and that he has given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection and that he'll be coming back again. So let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptation, we believe. We believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and that he has given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, and we believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and that he's coming back again. Let the lost be found, and the dead be raised. In the here and now, let love invade. Let the church live loud, our God will say, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail, for the power of God has torn the veil, the veil being the veil in the uh, temple. We believe. We believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and that he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe in the, that he conquered death, we believe in the resurrection, and that he's coming back again. As we gather around this table this morning, these are the things we believe in. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 26, Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper. And he says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. As we partake of this, we are saying that we believe in God, we believe in the Holy Spirit, we believe that Jesus has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, we believe in the crucifixion, that Jesus did die, he was put in a tomb, but he, raised, he was raised again, God asked him out, and he is in heaven, and that he is going to come again. I just uh, ask that when you partake of these, remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. And just think of how we can be thankful that myself or any one of us can get up here and say that we believe in Jesus Christ. And I don't have to fear about going to jail for it, for being killed for it. You might have some people snicker at me for us whatever, not a big deal. But with what's going on in the Middle East right now with ISIS, we're hearing about Christians being tortured, killed, all because they believe in our Savior. Uh, it's not just the Middle East, it's all over the world. And uh, let us be thankful that we can do this freely here. And in our freedom, I think we should uh, support these Christians who are being persecuted, whether that's in prayer, missions, whatever. But let's partake of these emblems and remember the great.
great freedom that we have in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much that you sent your son as a sacrifice so that we could have eternal life with you. God, we just uh, pray for those Christians that are being persecuted right now. Father, we just pray that they may realize that whatever horrors they're seeing now, you are greater than that. And in the end, Jesus is coming back. And he's going to set everything right. And that he has prepared a place for us with him. And we're going to spend eternity with him. Father, we just thank you so much for that. We pray this in Jesus' name.
for you. Uh, this is what it says in Philippians chapter 3, 12 to 14 about shaking it off and moving forward. It says, not that I've already obtained all of this or that I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win a prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You may be seated. Let's ask a blessing on God's word this morning. There's so much to be thankful for. Uh, so let's go to him in prayer. God, I just thank you uh, that we can come together as your people. Um, and as Derek said, to, to be free from persecution, to be able to have the freedom to express ourselves, our feelings, our beliefs. And Lord, just to be together and to worship you, to celebrate the life that we have in you. Our uh, Lord, <laughs> it's sometimes hard to contain ourselves. It's just so exciting to think about uh, the many ways that you work in our lives. The, whether you bless us through our family or the community that we have around us, the amazing community that we have here in Wayman. Uh, Lord, uh, help us to be a community that's on the move. A community that's seeking you, that desires to know you more. Uh, Lord, help us to forget what was in the past, to focus on what is ahead. And that's what you have in store for us in your son, Jesus. Lord, we just pray for some wisdom today. Help us to take something home with us that we can apply to our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. Most of us have a hard time with the whole shaking it off and letting it go process. Somebody also said that a fitting song would have been, let it go, let it go, you know, from Frozen. Um, but I thought that's a little cheesy. But sometimes we need to let things go so we can move forward. I know that I do. And it's a struggle for us to shake things off, to move forward, to just let them go. You and I should never, though, become emotional memory sticks, downloading and saving every hurtful word, every event, and every moment um, that have been mistakes in the past or burdens that are on our hearts. We all need to process our hurt in a healthy way and discard it, get rid of it, move on from it. God never intended for any of us to hold on to some worldly troubles that we carry around with us each and every day, like an anvil hooked to our legs. Our God is not a God like that, that's looking to punish us, to bring hurt on us. Our God is a God of do-overs, of new starts, of second chances, fresh starts, new beginnings. You can call it whatever you want. He doesn't have limitations on what he wants to do, to you, do for you. He doesn't have limitations on how many times that you even have this starting over process beginning in your life. But sometimes I think we lose sight of what God can do because of something that's happened to us in the past that's hurt us and has got us stuck in the mud real good. It's hard for us sometimes to move forward when we've got into a rut. It's hard for us to see God's plan for us revealed before us when we're stuck in such a difficult time of life. We're kind of like the monkey in the coconut. I don't know if you've ever heard that story before. It's kind of an old one. Um, there's an old story about villagers who were in a far-off land and they wanted to capture some monkeys. So one clever person thought of cutting a hole inside of a coconut and stuffing a piece of banana in it because we all know monkeys like bananas. So he placed this coconut in a tree after he put the banana in it and he frequently visited this tree to see if any monkeys had been caught because he knew that he'd catch a lot of monkeys in these trees if there was a banana there. Within minutes of putting this coconut in the tree, a monkey wandered by when he smelled that banana. He put his hand inside of that coconut, just as predicted. As the villagers approached to nab the monkey, the monkey couldn't climb down from the tree because it was clutching the banana inside of that coconut and it refused to let go. And so it was stuck in a very, very difficult situation. If he had let go of this banana, he would have been able to get a quick getaway and get away from his capture. But because he did not let go, he was caught in the trap. Aren't we all kind of like monkeys sometimes? Where we get our hands into something, and we hold on to it so tight, and we miss out on what life we have in store for us. Because we're holding on to something of the past that's holding us back. Maybe this morning you're here and you're stuck. You're frozen in a moment. It could be a personal failure of some kind or something completely beyond your control. Sometimes our banana is our past. We, walk, we want to walk in freedom, but we just refuse to let go of the past that holds us trapped. 
We can't walk in freedom if we keep our hand in that coconut of our past, holding on to every hurt, every pain, every rejection that has come our way in this life and disappointment that we've went through. We need to learn to drop the banana and move forward from that spot in our life. Sometimes what we're holding on to is the grudges that we have towards other people, and we find it difficult for us to forgive. Of course I can forgive, if I want to. But forgiveness, although it seems like such a simple thing, can be so hard. Sometimes we'd rather hold on to the banana of anger, resentment, hurt feelings, rather than just go and forgive, let go and move on from something, to take the first move and forgive someone. It's ultimately an act of selflessness, moving beyond our wounded pride and letting go. Just think about what the world would be like, though, if people could let go of their pride, could let go of that unforgiveness that was in their life, those struggles that they have with other people. If people tried doing that, letting go just for a moment, and opening themselves up to something different and allowing their minds to change, I think we would see a lot more peace in this world. In fact, I truly believe if we just let go of those things, then unlike the monkey, we could end up having the coconut and the banana if we chose to just believe in what God has in store for us and let go of those struggles, let go of that pain, and allow God to help us process it. When you think about all the people throughout the Bible whom God forgave, He redeemed, and He used in mighty ways, how can we ever really doubt that God could redeem our lives and make our start better if we trust in Him? Because He would. Your past is not your destiny. Your past it doesn't define you. If you refuse to give up hope and allow God to lead you from your stuck place, then He will do that. And He has a bright future in store for all of us when we choose to believe and trust in Him. So what is it today, as you're here this morning, that you think of, that you're holding on to? That, that one thing that's holding you back from moving forward in your life? How long do you intend to allow people who mistreat you or certain circumstances in your life to influence you the way that you live your life? Every one of us who are here this morning, we're holding on to something that's trapping us. We all have struggles. We all live with those things that hold us back from moving forward in life. But your past, it's past now. It's gone. You're no longer your past. Your past does not define you. Your past influences you, but your past does not need to define the way that you live now. What matters today is not your past, but what's happening from here on out. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 8 to 19, we're challenged this. Forget those former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I make a new way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This passage here, as we read it, it gives us a description here of a life that has been damaged by past hurts, by past struggles. A life that has become essentially like a wasteland, a desert wilderness. Have you ever felt that way before in your life, where you were just at a spot where it just seems life is mundane, it's the same thing all the time, and you don't know where you're going to go? I think we've all been there before where it seems that our life is desolate, is going nowhere quick. Dwelling on a record of wrong things, that weighs us down. And it gives us heavy burdens and it makes it so that we get stuck in those wilderness moments of life. But if we want to experience the new things that God has for us, we need to stop focusing on the past. We need to look beyond the desert and we need to see that God will lead us to the promised land when we focus on Him and follow His leading for the future. Focus on your goal, not your habits. This is why diets never work. When you're on a diet, what's the thing that matters the most to you? What do you focus on most of the time? Food, you know? And diets, well, they're essentially gone today. It's Thanksgiving, right? We're all going to pick out. But uh, I'm looking forward to that later. But really, diets, they're wasteful. They don't even make any sense, you know? The focus of the diet's food, so it's hard for us to diet. You think far more about food when you're on a diet than when you're off of a diet. Or take, for example, someone who's a smoker and they want to quit. And they say, one of these days I'm going to give up smoking because I know it's bad for me. But the whole time he's focused on what he doesn't want to do, rather than what he actually wants to accomplish to begin with. That keeps you stuck in a rut. And we're focused on something else rather than what we want to accomplish. 
But God says to us, don't focus on the things of where you've been, but focus on where you want to go, where I am leading you, where I am calling you. Look beyond your hardship to something better. This is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 in our scripture today. He's talking about perfection. He's talking about his coming heavenward, you know, getting to where God wants him to be. He says, not that I've already obtained this, not that I've already gotten there, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Jesus took hold of me. Notice here in this passage how Paul acknowledges the very fact that he still hasn't reached his goal yet. You know, he's not dead, he's not gone. There's still plenty that God's got to do with him here as he lives on this earth. So he acknowledges, I'm not perfect, I don't have it all together yet. You know, I haven't reached my goal yet. And so God hasn't brought him where he needs to be. His spiritual journey, it was incomplete, just like ours. You know, we're still here, I think we're all breathing, check your pulse. You know, we're alive. God still has a purpose. He still has a plan for us, whether or not we're seven or we're 70 or even older than that. Um, God has a plan as long as we're here. So he says he has not arrived, and he knew that there was still work to be done. Pastor and teacher Chuck Swindoll says this one time. He said, God is seeking progress, not perfection. Some people get discouraged when they aren't progressing quickly enough. But moving forward, it takes time. It's a process. It's a progress. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for a gradual progress. He's looking for us to seek His guidance in our lives, His will in our lives, as He begins that work on us. And He shapes us into who He's called us to be. The Christian life is not one of perfection. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. None of us here in this room are perfect. Although we might want to see, think that sometimes we're not. There's still lots that God's doing, you know. And he's always working out those kings. He's helping us. And here's the thing about the Christian life. The Christian life is one of growth and maturity. It's one of progress. And as each day passes, we learn some new things. So as we go about life on this earth, don't be discouraged. Don't allow your past struggles to hold you back. Don't dwell on what you've done wrong, but dwell on Christ. Don't be defined by your sin but by your Savior. That's what Paul is getting at here. The Apostle Paul, he remembered his past, no doubt. He remembered where he came from. More than once in the Bible, he describes his failures, but he also describes his accomplishments. But he chose not to live in the past. Instead, he was aiming higher than his past. He was aiming and pressing onward towards greater things that God had in store for him. In Philippians chapter 3, 13, Paul says this, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, he says. He's pushing onward towards something better. He recognizes where he was in the past, but he says, that's not me. That's not where I am now. I am defined by him, by Jesus. And I'm straining onward towards what he has in store for me now. Maybe you sense God is asking you to let something go. Perhaps you're here today and you desperately want to let something go that's holding you back. But it's hard for you to let go. Because you don't know what that's going to mean for you. It's uncertain how that's going to pan out. Letting go in the Daryl translation is defined as this. Giving up what is beyond your control to embrace what you can change. Giving up what's beyond your control, the things we can't do on our own or control to embrace what you can change. We can't control our past. We can't go back unless we're like Marty McFly and have a time machine. We can't go back there. We can't revisit that. We can't change that. And therefore, we must focus on the miracles that are around us today, the things that God is doing right with us today in this present day. When the pressure of discouragement threatens to overwhelm you, press on towards God's sure word. What we know is constant, what we know is true, what we know is present. And recognize that in our hardship, that God gives us his love and his grace. We can't control the negative people around, there's no doubt about that. But we can choose to look for our encouragement and our joy in life in God's word. Each new day of your life is a gift from God. And he wants us, each and every one of us, to live life fully, to enjoy life, to shake it off, and to be able to just dance, to just love the fact that God has given us the breath 
and to celebrate the life that he gives each and every one of us. Each new day is a new day for us to celebrate that. And here today, as we're together as believers in Christ, we celebrate the fact that we have life in Him. Not just life here in the now, but eternally. The pain that we've suffered in the past, it doesn't have to affect us here in the now. But we can't fully embrace the new life God has for us if we're holding on to where we were before. We need to understand that God needs us to let that stuff go and strive onward to what is ahead. Because if we focus on what is past, then we'll find ourselves in the frustrating cycle that leaves us in hopelessness. We need to release the past so the past can release us. It's the only way that we will ever move forward is by letting it go. The key to overcoming your past is by making choices that invite God's hope into your life. Philippians chapter 3, 14, Paul goes on to say in our scripture, I press on toward the goal to win a prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Someone once told me one time, aim at nothing and you're bound to hit it. But aim at something and even if you come up short, you'll be further along than if you didn't strive at all. And I think there's a little bit of truth to that saying, that if you aim at nothing, you're bound to hit it. You're aiming to get nothing out of it. But if you aim at something, even if you come up short, you'll at least be further along in your journey than where you were to begin with. If we're striving with all that we have to be like Jesus Christ, if we're striving with all that we have to follow Him, then there is no doubt that we will see His grace working in and through our lives as He transforms our lives and as He helps us to have hope even in those bumpy moments of life. And He'll raise us beyond those moments as we seek Him in those trying times. When Paul was talking about his being called heavenward, I believe what he was saying here is that my story, it's not done yet. God's not done writing this story yet. He's still writing. He hasn't put down his pen. God, I believe, is the author of our story. He's the one who breathed life into mankind, and from the very beginning of time, he began to write this incredible story on the hearts of his people. We read about that all throughout Scripture, the many lives that he's changed. In fact, we see that in the testimonies of the lives that have been changed here today. People could tell you about how God has changed their lives and done incredible things in and through them throughout the years. And as I look back on my own years, I can see how God has just been working, how he's put the pieces together. And you know what? He has so many great things to write. What's he writing in your story? What's God saying as he writes your story? What's the legacy that he's leading you to? The theme of God's word is love. Grace is its rhythm. And the ink is the collision between the ordinary, which is you and I, and the supernatural. God. And here's the thing, as we trust in God as we're on this journey, God makes it so that as we rely on Him as ordinary people, He will do supernatural and extraordinary things in our lives. So God is not done writing yet. He's still, still doing something pretty amazing. But what is He doing? What's He doing in your life right now? As you look at your life, how will your story read if you look back on what's been written and look forward to what is yet to come? We must be careful not to smuggle our past into the future, but instead focus our eyes on the prize and to press onward to which, that which God has for us. God's at work in our lives each and every day. Whether or not we see him there or not, he's always working. And for those who believe, we're able to see that tomorrow is going to be different from yesterday. In fact, tomorrow is always going to be better than yesterday as we trust in him. There was a man who was a former atheist, and a well-known Christian writer now who writes of this testimony, writes of this life change. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he once said this, There are far, far better things ahead than any that we leave behind. You know, this guy, he was a skeptic for years, and, and here he's a, a tremendous testimony of a man who's seen God at work. So as you think about the better things that you're leaving behind and what's ahead for you, where is your focus? Are your eyes focused on yesterday or on God and what he's doing today? God doesn't want us living in the sorrows of yesterday or even the joys of yesterday, in fact. We have a life that's worth living right now in this present day. God has something special for us right in this current moment, right here in the now. But many of us miss it. 
when we're focused so much on the glory days or on those hardships of the past. Let go of the things of the past because your past does not dictate your future. But you can learn from what has already been written in your story. So as you look back on your story, what is it from our past that we can learn and grow from it and change our direction and look for God's higher calling in our life? Sometimes changing is part of God's plan. So let God lead you and guide you down the different path that he might have in store for you to take. I don't know about you, but when I was a teenager, I had lots of plans about what my life would look like as an adult. And today, not many of those dreams have unfolded exactly as I had intended. But you know what? Thank God for that. Um, because I would have been in a totally different place, and who knows where I would have been. But I don't know how many times I've went the different direction than God, and God has still done something great, that he's done something amazing. I can tell you so many stories of God moments as I look back, and it's like, wow, it just blows my mind how God was working, and I didn't even see him doing it. Don't fear those changes. Embrace them. Recognize that change is a good thing when God is a part of it. Skills, they grow and die, but we learn new ones. Responsibilities, they change. Opportunities, they come and they go. But through it all, I encourage you, don't give up. Press onward. Keep on cruising. Don't stop moving forward. Don't let your past keep you there, nor the present sufferings drag you down to the pit. Because as Taylor Swift says, it's going to be all right. Have faith in God's leading, and don't lose hope. Shake it off, and before you know it, God will lead you to greater things than what you could have ever anticipated. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, we get this promise in Paul's words as he thinks back on his journey. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Fight the good fight. That's all God calls us to do. To fight the good fight of faith. To remain faithful to him as he's been faithful to us. This time I'll ask the band come as I conclude with this story. In 1952, there was a woman by the name of Florence Chadwick who attempted to swim 26 miles from the coast of California to Catalina Island. That is a long journey. I would drown. In fact, I'd probably drown the second I got in that water. But after 15 hours of her journey, a heavy fog began to block her view, and she became disoriented, and she eventually gave up on her mission. To her frustration, Chadwick learned that she had quit just one mile short of her destination. Had to have been discouraging. Two months later, Chadwick tried a second time to swim to Catalina Island from the coast. Again, a thick fog began to settle in and close in on her, but this time she reached her destination becoming the very first woman to swim the Catalina Channel. Chadwick said she kept an image of the shoreline in her mind even when she couldn't see it. When the problems of life close in on your life, and your vision seems impaired and you can't see where you're going because the fog is so thick, you and I have that same opportunity with God. With our goal in mind, which is heavenward in Christ Jesus, let us press onward to the promise that we have of eternal life in Him. And let us remember the words of Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 2, that promises this. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. When you and I feel like quitting, this is our signal to remember. Not only did Jesus suffer for us, but he now helps us to endure as we go about this race, as we go about this journey together. Until that day, we see him face to face, may we press onward towards him, our Savior, let us not focus on our sin. Let us not be defined by our sin, but by Jesus who came and he laid down his life so that we may be freed from the sin that we are so easily entangled by and that we may walk in the newness of life. If today you want to make Jesus your short line, you want to make Jesus your focus of your life, 
I want to invite you to come as we sing our closing song today. And if you want to make the decision, we can talk about that and we'll baptize you in, in Jesus' name. So will you please stand as we sing our closing song. Thank you.